Welcome to the program. I'm Jeff Sheckman. There is not a day that goes by that the subject of immigration is not in some way part of our national discussion. However, with all the talk, there is so little focus on either the large number of immigrants that arrive from China or anything about the immigrant experience. We think little about what it must be like leaving one's country, friends, family, and culture to begin anew as a stranger in a strange land. Perhaps if we all understood the commitment, the bravery, and the strength it takes to do that, we'd be having a very different conversation about immigration. We're going to talk about this today with my guest, Lauren Hilgers. Lauren Hilgers spent six years living in Shanghai, China. Her articles have appeared in Harper's, Wired, Business Week, and The New Yorker. It is my pleasure to welcome her here to talk about her new book, Patriot Number 1, American Dreams in Chinatown, Lauren, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. A delight to have you here. Before we talk about the immigrant experience and this family that, that literally almost showed up on your doorstep, talk a little bit about <laughs> your time in China, your six years living over there, how that came to be, and, and, and what you took away from that. Um, well, I lived in Shanghai. I, I, I was 26 when I went to Shanghai, and I had been working as like a, a metro journalist in Los Angeles. And... I decided that I wanted to get out and do something different and try my hand at freelancing. Uh, and it was a great, it was a great place to sort of um, cut your teeth as a, as a journalist, I think, because the cost of living was cheap and there are a lot of, there's a lot of things going on in China that people don't necessarily have access to. And it's also a difficult place to report. So you get used to sort of, being persistent, um, <laughs> and, and different ways, uh, different, you, you sort of learn how to think your way into a story from different angles. So you're not always trying to approach it in the same way that everyone else is because the difficulty of reporting is there. So I think I, I, I learned a lot from, from my time in, in China. And what did you learn from people that wanted to immigrate out of China, immigrate specifically to the U.S.? It's an interesting question. I think because this is something that I didn't really understand until I moved back to New York and started talking to immigrants that had come. Uh, there's a lot of curiosity about the U.S. when I, when I was there. I had a lot of conversations about what it's like if we were all wealthy, if everyone had a gun. So it was a, it was definitely something that was on people's minds, but I didn't really, I never reflected on kind of the allure of the American dream and how it still exists and it still exerts a great pull over people until I came here and really started to understand that the reality was different than people had, than people's expectations. People really um, thought they were coming to a country that was wealthy and welcoming where life would be, if not totally easy, at least um, success would be there for the taking uh, if you were willing to work hard, which is not always the case. So I think in China, I kind of had all of these conversations that made me reflect on what it meant to be an, an American, because you were talking about wars in Iraq at the time I was there. And uh people were sort of vaguely aware of the political situation and what was going on and the financial, I was there through the financial crisis, but it wasn't until I, I came back that I started really thinking about the American dream. And when you heard this dream, when you heard this sense of the streets paved with proverbial gold from people, <laughs> did you try and dissuade them of that notion or did you just listen and sort of roll your eyes to yourself maybe? Yes, I definitely had the sense. Again, I didn't really know what the experience of immigration was like until I started writing this book. But I had the sense that it was much harder than people expected it to be. And one of the um, one of the f first times I remember having this discussion out loud was with um, the Zhuang Liao Hong, the man that I follow in the book. When he first brought it up to me, he thought he was saying he, he wanted to escape the political situation in his village, and he thought that he might try and escape to the U.S. And I remember thinking that I was trying to let him down gently, that the U.S. was not a place that be, would be as – it would be a very difficult transition for him in a way that he, he wasn't anticipating. Mm -hmm. 
And tell us about this couple, this family that, that almost shows up on your doorstep in, uh, back in New York. So I met uh, Jolia Hong, who is the, he's really the reason they all ended up in New York in 2000, actually 2013. In 2012, I started going to his village in southern China. And Wukan, it was one of the last assignments that I, magazine assignments that I'd taken in this village in 2011 had exploded in um, anti-corruption protests, basically. They were, the villagers were protesting corrupt um, government officials who were selling off pieces of village land and kind of lining their pockets with the money. And in 2011, there had been three protests that were really explosive and a lot of media had gotten in. And one of the ways that they resolved this standoff, the very last protest, they actually, the villagers blocked the roads and there were villagers on one side of the blockade and armed police on the other. And there was this kind of lengthy standoff that was very unusual and impressive. And one of the ways that the local government resolved the the situation was to allow the villagers to have their own elections for village, the village committee. And so the story that I was originally doing was about how this village was running democratically, how these newly elected leaders who had no experience and weren't very well educated, I don't think maybe a few had graduated from high school, but that was the extent of education and who had lived their lives in a authoritarian country, how they were running this kind of small time village democracy. And that's where I met Zhuang Le Hong. Zhuang Le Hong was, he had been one of the leaders of the protest and he had also been elected onto the village committee. And by the time I came to Wukhan, he had quit the village committee and was running a tea shop. And I was, I was sort of walking by and he was blasting Michael Jackson out of his tea <laughs> shop. And so I stopped. <laughs> I stopped in curiosity because it's not every day you hear Michael Jackson blasting through the doors of a, you know, village tea shop. And he kind of beckoned me inside and we hid our cell phones because everyone in the village was convinced that their cell phones were being um, listened in on. And he started telling me his story about the protest and who he was. And over time, I visited the village repeatedly and each time I would go see him. And then I met his wife, little Yen and their child, and they would sort of, you know, welcome me into their house and cook me food. And, um, if the situation was a little dicey after a while, people, um, journalists were sort of getting kicked out of the village. They, they were always very sort of helpful and would warn me. Um, so they were, I, you know, I, they weren't people that I thought that I would keep in touch with for the rest of my life, but they were definitely kind of a, a, an anchor of the community. Um, and and then in 2014, I had moved back to New York and Zhuang and Little Yen fled their village because the political situation was getting worse and did just show up on my doorstep in mm-hmm. Brooklyn. Mm-hmm. And, and that's kind of the the start of the book really is when I realized that I wasn't writing a story about a village anymore, I was writing a story about this couple, um, was when they showed up on my doorstep and when they started kind of grappling with the transition that they would have to make from living in China to living in the U.S. What did and how, they, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, what did they expect from you at that point? I don't think they knew. So when he started contacting me, so I had moved back to the U.S. and I was sort of writing this magazine story and he started calling me. And the first phone call I got was from Zhuang and Little Yan had had left their son behind with her parents and had signed up for this tour of the United States. And so the first phone call I got was from Hawaii and Zhuang just said, I'm in Hawaii and I'll maybe be seeing you soon and then had to hang up the phone. So. I don't think I didn't really know what to expect. And I don't think he knew either. He was definitely asking for my help, but I, I think he, he, we didn't know each other that well. I don't think he had thought it through. I think a lot of the things about coming to the U S and I think this is true for a lot of immigrants is it sort of gets a little fuzzy. Once you get to the U S you have this idea of hard work and success and you know, the people that will greet you there 
but it's hard to really make a concrete plan or, or envision a, a concrete reality. So I don't think he knew. As somebody that had, I won't say immigrated, but gone as yourself as, as kind of a stranger to a strange land when you went to, to Shanghai, did you have a better understanding of what the experience might be like? Oh, I had no idea. Because <laughs> I think uh, going to Shanghai as an American, especially I, I went over in 2006, there were a lot of opportunities for people who spoke English and spoke a little Mandarin. And there was, and there were a lot of people going over at the time and, and you sort of found other Americans or other foreigners. And it was, there was a real sense of community. I was, it was just a totally different position to be in. And for Zhuang Liahong and, and little Yen, not only did they know no one in Flushing, <laughs> there wasn't that, sort of ready-made community. Even though they moved to a Chinese neighborhood, there weren't just people looking for friends. Everyone was kind of wary of each other. And you're, because everyone is sort of, a, a, a lot of people are trying to get status or have come without documentation or have let their, you know, there's all these sort mm -hmm. of uh, gray areas. Uh, people are very suspicious of each other. So it's a much more one of the things that surprised me was how isolating this experience was, that they didn't easily make friends, that they were wary of their fellow immigrants. Um, and that, for most of the people that I, I met in Flushing, was true. And why was that? Well, I think um, there's a couple of reasons. I think people work really long hours. Um, in the Chinese immigrant community. If you work in a restaurant, you're probably working 10 or 12 hours a day. A lot of people go outside of the city, so they'll they'll have a base in, in, in one of New York's Chinatowns. They're kind of three main ones. And then they'll go out for a couple months and work in a restaurant in, like, you know, rural Maryland. And then they'll come back. So there's not that much time to build a community. But also there is this sense of danger you might be taken advantage of and i and i think that exists if if you know if you if you go work for the wrong boss there's a sense that they, they might cheat you but there's a and and you're new you don't really know the rules of the neighborhood so there are people cheating newly arrived immigrants so it, i think it's a combination of those two things and also china is very big and often in china someone from one village or one, you know, part of China will not necessarily relate or trust someone from another part of China. Was it your sense that you wanted to be able to tell their story? You wanted to be able to understand the experience they were going through? And, and how much have you wanted to help in some way? Well, when they first came, I... Uh, you know, I was writing this magazine story, but this was something completely different. They were asking me for help, and I, because I knew the situation in the village where they were coming from, Wukhan, I didn't feel like I could refuse. I, I didn't think that there was no way I was going to say, no, I won't let you stay in my apartment. Um, figure, your own, figure your own life out. Because I, I knew them. Um, so... It took me a while after they got to the U.S. to really think about writing a book and, and realize that I was interested in writing a book and that their experience, as extraordinary as it was, was also representative of a bunch of immigrants that were living in Flushing. So about a year after Zhuang and Little Yan came, I started talking to them about the possibility of writing a book. And we sort of discussed what that would look like and went back and forth and then they said you know yes go ahead so that's when I really started writing in earnest mm -hmm. and as you watch them try and get settled talk a little bit about that you you talked about the fact that there was such suspicion with respect mm -hmm. to other immigrants what what helped them what what enabled them to settle in a little bit uh you know funny enough he I I have 
seen John get the same question, and he said his answer was nothing helped us. It's been mm-hmm. really hard. Uh, but I, I mean, I do think they had some advantages. They uh, had a little money. They didn't. A lot of immigrants go into debt to get to the United States, and they were not in debt when they arrived. So they had a, a cushion of money. So it helped them kind of take some time to adjust. Uh, and I think I, I, it was just a very hard transition. I think that John got here and really didn't want to give up his life, which is something that a lot of immigrants are willing to do. They sort of say, okay, I'm going to work 10 to 12 hours a day. I'm going to you know, just work and sleep and eat, basically, and, and I'm doing this for the next generation. And John didn't he didn't want to do that. And I wouldn't want to do that either. So he really floundered for a number of years trying to find out what work he was comfortable doing and, and who he was now that he was in this new place, because he had been an important person in his village. And all of a sudden he found himself a nobody in Flushing. How important was that? How much of, I mean, there is the sense as as you write about him, that this whole issue of identity was such a critical issue. Yeah, and that was something, you know, if you talked to little Yen, it was really interesting because she would say, well, I'm a woman, and and she was also born in a small village, and, and I don't think expected much of her life. So she was saying, well, I'm a woman, I don't have time to worry about these things, I just have to work and keep the family together. And so she really had this, and there's a concept of eating bitter in Chinese. She really had, which means kind of your ability to suffer hardship. And she had this sense that she was kind of made to suffer hardship, and that's what she would do, and this is just a new kind of hardship. But Zhuang, was, is, he and continues to be a, a dreamer, and he wanted a different kind of life. He wanted friends. He wanted family. He was used to the situation in his village where people sort of, you know, you'd leave your door open and people would walk in and out. And he was used to a situation where people listened to him. And it was coming to the U.S. as it was, that was one of the hardest things for him was all of a sudden being this person that nobody cared about. And I, it, it took him a long time. And he also was very impacted by the events that continued to happen back in his village. So he was sort of torn between the two realities. He would spend nights on his phone kind of listening to reports of what was happening and then be exhausted in the morning when he was trying to go to work. So it it took him a long time, and I still don't know if he really has found a perfect balance between the two things. And to what extent did he have regrets about making the journey? I think on and off he has had regrets. There have been moments where he's thought maybe this wasn't worth it. But I think very quickly after he left the village, and some of his fellow villagers kind of criticized him for making that decision. And then maybe two weeks, two or three weeks after he showed up in New York, um, some of the other members of the village committee were arrested and since then, there have been sort of subsequent crackdowns. It's pretty clear that if he had stayed, he would be in jail um, for his kind of democracy mm-hmm. activities. So I don't know if he really he, – he, he wishes he could have stayed. And there are moments where he's wondered if it's worth it. But I don't think he had – I think that this was – it's clear that this was the right choice. Was his experience from what you saw – was his experience the norm – or did other immigrants assimilate and, and adjust more quickly? I think um, sort of during the course of the book, I start expanding its scope, and I, and I talk to, I profile a couple other immigrants in the neighborhood that they became friends with because their community has sort of expanded and, and built, albeit very slowly. And I think there are many things about their experience that is that I found to be the norm, particularly the isolation and the hard work and this feeling that you can't trust anybody. Um, I think women tend to have a different experience than men. And, and 
maybe not everyone struggles quite so much with these issues of identity because it wasn't, it's, you know, then maybe they were a migrant worker back in China and now they're a migrant worker in the United States. So the jump was not quite as large as it was for Zhuang. But one of the reasons I started being interested in writing the book was that I was meeting other people in Flushing that, while they didn't have this experience of being a democracy activist, were struggling with some of the same issues. And what surprised you the most? What, if anything, changed your understanding of what this immigrant experience was like? I think, um, well, there, it, was, it was full of surprises. I, I think the sort of experience of being surrounded by people but still really isolated was one of the things that really surprised me. Um, after one of the first things I did with John and Little Yen was help them find a room to live in. So we went up to Flushing and we looked at advertisements in the back of the newspaper and ended up going to what looked like kind of a suburban house. And But when you went to the door, every bedroom in the house had a separate family living in it. So there's a shared kitchen. Zhuang and Little Yen, that place had their own bathroom. But it was really packed kind of extraordinarily tightly. And still they had this experience of being isolated and having no friends. For the first couple of weeks, they left their door to their room open, kind of hoping that someone would come by and introduce themselves. They didn't. And that really shocked me. And I, as I sort of continued reporting... At one point, I stayed in kind of an immigrant hostel for a few nights uh, just to sort of get a sense of, of mm-hmm. how other people were living. And these hostels were apartments that had many beds in them that you would rent out for the night, you know, for like 10 or $15 a night. And I talked to some nail salon workers and some restaurant cooks, and most of them were kind of coming back to the neighborhood for a couple of days to see friends and family and then heading out again. And everyone I talked to had the same experience of feeling isolated you'd be for example you'd be in a bedroom with like five beds stuffed in it and everyone would be just kind of playing on their computers or looking at their phones and they wouldn't you know never talk to each other and how did they react to reading about themselves as you've written about it in patriot number one well they can't they don't read english Hmm. and it hasn't been translated yet so they haven't read the whole thing um we've gone through kind of what episodes in their life is (laughs) are in each chapter. Uh, But I, and I think, and we've had lots of discussions, particularly with Zhuang about how this is, uh, it is not the same story that he would write if he were to write about his life. I think if he were to write about his life, it would be mainly about the events in his village and and it would skip the hard parts, I think. Um, And he's been very, very generous about it. He's been very, and the things that have come out, the review in the New York Times was translated into Mandarin, and and, and he's been a, you know, just 100% positive about everything he's seen. And, I, and one of the wonderful things about Zhuang is that while he's, he can be frustrating and he can, you know, he has a little bit of a fiery temper sometimes, he's very willing to kind of admit his fault and discuss, you know, things that he's done wrong in the past. And so in that way, he's been just incredibly open and generous about the whole process. Lauren Hilgers, her book is Patriot Number 1, American Dreams in Chinatown. It's just out from Crown. Lauren, I thank you so much for spending time with us. Thank you for having me. Thank you.